Um, I'm a coastal geomorphologist. It's quite a mouthful. I usually just shorten and say coastal geologist. But my focus has always been on the coastal processes that move the rocks. And uh, there's a lot of implications for that along the coast. Uh, we've have, we have a lot of the coastal processes, waves, tides, uh, winds that you all are familiar with. Um, but the combination, uh, the intersection of those uh, where the land meets the sea is really kind of where I've specialized, uh, looking specifically at beaches and coastal lagoons. Uh, and I have a lot of variety of both uh, observations from being on the water and on the beaches, as well as uh, modeling and uh, quantitative experiences. This is going to be fun. Everybody will know this password by the end of the night. <laughs> um, so uh, I better just talk fast so it doesn't happen. So I'm going to try and go through uh, coastal beaches and lagoons of Santa Cruz, um, past, present, and future. So uh, I'm going to try and talk, cover today some very simple beach processes uh, in Santa Cruz, um, talk about lagoon or bar-built estuaries, which is sort of a unique habitat, unique um, in geomorphic setting along the central coast of California and then talk specifically about a few beaches that are near and dear to many of us um, that range from more naturally functioning beaches and lagoons and to those that are really in an urban setting like the San Lorenzo and Seabright. Um, and then I'm gonna wrap up talking about what the future may look like. Uh, I completed a project earlier this year looking at the potential future coastal hazards related to sea level rise um, that should be available online in the next couple of weeks. And that will be something that uh, a lot of the planners and managers are looking at uh, and using to make decisions both on a you know, individual parcel level planning decisions and larger regional decisions like the trail councils and transportation uh, improvements. So Beaches have always fascinated me. When I was little, I used to put sand in my bed right after my mom changed the sheets because it just felt more homey. Um, and I've grown up on the beach. Uh, my son Banyan here sitting in the front row is my lagoon helper and a beach enthusiast in training. He gets to go to Maui next week for the first time and understand what warm water is about. Um, beaches change uh, this is one a classic time and space uh, continuum. Uh, on one axis, you have uh, time. Now I've got way too much going on to point even now. Um, on the left axis, we have uh, space. So we're talking about really tiny features. Um, and on the bottom, we have time going from seconds to centuries. And you can look at turbulence, white water on the beach in something that happens over millimeters and over seconds, all the way out to climate change, which happens over the globe and over centuries. Um, there's a lot of interesting features. The waves and winds are happening in the seconds to minutes um, across kilometers. Uh, we have a lot of tides that function you know, on a twice a day here in Santa Cruz that affect uh, the entire coast of California. Um, and then we have a variety of things in the beach. Wow, can you set it so it has a longer? Okay. All right, this is gonna be fun. Um, so uh, let's go to the next one. Just like in natural beaches, um, we also have a scale of human alterations. Humans are part of this coastal system and we have done a lot of things that have altered the functioning of it. And I'll talk about some of those locally here. Um, we start with sandcastle building. I have seen rip currents start from kids digging a moat and building a sandcastle. I have witnessed almost everybody in this room is an aspiring coastal engineer. We've all built a sandcastle, we've all built a moat and a wall to hold back the ocean, and we have all failed. <laughs> the Army Corps of Engineers does this for a living. <laughs> and it takes a really long time. Um, we've affected our global climate as well. Out to greenhouse gas emissions, 
But one of the big things we've done at medium to larger scales is affected the shape of the beaches, yes. affected the <laughs> amount of sand and sediments that reach our beaches and control the widths of our beaches, which drive a lot of other economic and tourist uh, features. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so beaches are formed sort of, it's a very simple equation, sand in minus sand out equals beach. If there's more sand coming into the system than going out, we have a nice wide sandy beach. If we have not enough sand coming in and too much sand going out, there is no beach and we're down to bedrock or up against the, the coastal armory. We're eroding the cliffs faster and faster. So this cartoon um, sort of shows that, you know, we get sand from a lot of sources. The primary source in Santa Cruz is from the rivers and creeks. There's also a significant component of sand that comes from cliff erosion. And um, during uh, different stands of sea level rise, when sea level is higher or lower, sand will be blown into sand dunes and stored there temporarily until large storms reactivate it and add that to the beach. Um, there are seasonal <coughs> cycles of onshore and offshore sand transport, and there's also what's called littoral drift. Waves will come not necessarily straight onto the coast, but at an angle, and at that angle, it sort of drives a current in one direction. Typically in the summertime, well, winds around here are primarily northwest, so most of the currents that are moving sand are coming, moving sand from the north to the south. Um, the ultimate loss of sand is typically to a submarine canyon. Here it's obviously the Monterey Canyon, um, but sand, uh, next slide. Um, but a lot of this happens not in an average annual sense. If you own, are fortunate enough to know, own an oceanfront property, you are, your setback is determined by an average annual erosion rate times some planning horizon, say 50 years. Nothing erodes at an average annual rate. <laughs> Nothing, the sediment moving past the dredge at the harbor does not happen at an average annual rate. It is all driven by large events, moving a lot of stuff, and then nothing happens. So depending upon how many years you average this over, you, if you had a 10 foot failure in one storm, you could say, well, we had 10 feet per day. Or if it didn't move another for 10 years, you could go, well, now we have a foot a year. So really the episodic sediment inputs, episodic storm events are really what drives changes to the coast. Banyan, do you have a question? Um, how does the water move the sand back into the ocean and back out? That is a great question. That is all the waves. Did everybody hear that? How does the sand get moved out from the ocean to the coast and back out. Next slide. I didn't prompt him, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> He's my helper. <laughs> so there are seasonal cycles in waves. <laughs> and um, that was awesome. <laughs> 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 um, so there's typically there in the summertime, the beaches are much wider and it's because the wave energy is much lower. And so what we have is this, is there a, oh, there's a uh, yeah, right here? Dead center. Dead center, okay. So uh, let's not call this a summertime beach because this doesn't apply to Santa Cruz, but let's call it a calm storm season and an energetic storm season, okay? Summer, winter, but um, really what happens is the beaches are, um, as waves are really low energy, long period south swells, where the swell is like two feet at 25 seconds, we get beach building. So the sand slowly moving up onto the beach, we get much higher beaches, wider beaches, steeper beaches at the top. But I also wanna point out that beaches aren't just what you see when you go to the beach. The sand on the beach extends offshore quite a distance and as long as the waves have the ability to, to um, move the sand at depth offshore, that's all part of the active beach. 
And so people say, oh, we, we had a, a huge erosion event and all the sand's gone. Doesn't necessarily mean that's true because what happens in the winter time is that sand's pulled off this wide sandy beach and pulled offshore into a sandbar. And beaches are amazing. They have natural defenses. This is a natural defense mechanism. It pulls the sand offshore, builds a sandbar, and causes the waves to break offshore. So now instead of the waves slamming into the beach in, in neck-breaking shore pound, that's say Seabright, it's now breaking offshore, and then by the time it rolls up on the shore, it doesn't have that same high energy. So between uh, a calm period and a high energy period, you have this seasonal fluctuation. Okay? Next slide. But beaches are really endangered. There's a lot of things going on that affect our beaches. Um, sea level is rise is one of them. Um, we have exponential population growth. That means when is the jar complete half full? If, if, the, if everybody is in, living in a jar on Earth, when is that jar half full? In exponential terms, it's one time step before it's full. So it's a curve, it's a hockey stick shaped curve that's moving up and it doubles, it, it, it's an exponential curve. So we also have increasing coastal development. How many of you have seen Santa Cruz go from a sleepy little beach town to a commuter town for, for San Jose to uh, now it takes an hour to get across town in the summertime? <laughs> We have a lot of increasing coastal development. Everybody wants to come vacation here to the coast. Eight of the 10 largest cities on our earth are on the coast. Um, as a result, we have built at zero. Everybody wants to live at zero, right next to the beach, right next to the coast, be able to look over the edge. Zero means sea level means that in order to stay at mean sea level, mean is an average, an average of 19 years of tides. Well, as that average goes up, zero gets higher. And so we're still built at the old zero back in the 40s, and zero has gotten higher over the last 50, 60 years. Um, and so what we see is a lot of increasing coastal armoring stop the erosion. And as we do that, we're, we're caught in this coastal squeeze. People are rushing to the coast, oceans are rising, and we're having to armor the coast to try and keep and protect the upland property. But there's a consequence to that. And that's our beaches, that's our coastal habitats, that's our recreational space, that's our towel space, that's our visitor generated income, that's our volleyball courts, that's our beach habitats. So there's decisions that are gonna be made around the country on how we prioritize that upland property versus that beach, versus that coastline. Next one, please. So there's this piece, this phenomenon that's been documented more frequently in the coastal squeeze called placement loss so if you go over to some of the pocket beaches on West Cliff, for example, or 26th Avenue, where those revetments are built at a two to one slope, and they're 50, 60 feet high, they're taking up 120 feet of what used to be a beach because of just the footprint of the structure. So that's called placement loss. Passive erosion, you can see in these pictures that you have this placement loss. This is the footprint of a revetment. This is the footprint of a seawall. It's much smaller than a revetment. But what happens is a road, as you armor this back shore, you kind of stop the upland erosion, but you start to narrow the beach in front of it. Meanwhile, erosion continues or even accelerates adjacent, and you can maintain a recreational beach or habitat here at the loss of some of this upland property. It's a trade-off every community is facing and how we're going to move into uh, adapting to climate change. Next slide, please. 
So this is sort of a cartoon here. This is a, a beach. Here's a house and some dunes, um, natural beach. As sea level and erosion happen, oh my gosh, the dunes eroding, we need to build a revetment. Instantly you lose this footprint. As you step through time, and I'm sorry you can't read all the writing, but that's fine, I'll just talk through it. As, this old, as the beach continues to erode, you start to narrow the towel space of the beach. As that goes to the next time, you lose the towel space entirely, and you're just now at dry sand, um, intertidal, like low tide beaches, much of like Pleasure Point, for example, um, or even 26th Avenue or West Side beaches, pocket beaches. And then ultimately, it's lapping at the coast throughout the tide cycles when there is no beach. This is something that will happen along the new Pleasure Point seawall over time. This is something that we can see up and down across Santa Cruz County, across the state of California. Next slide, please. Um, there's, the beach is also a fascinating ecosystem. And one of the reasons, and it's really hard to see this. Many movies have been made, like aliens, that have used beach bugs, for lack of a, I'm not a biologist. I'm sorry if I offend biologists in the room tonight. Um, I don't speak Latin so well. Um, and I learned in kindergarten not to call everybody names. Um, and so, but beaches form, have a really unique sandy beach ecosystem where uh, algae, kelp, um, is deposited on the beach called marine rack. The beach hoppers, beach bugs, little invertebrates will come and eat that. And then they form uh, the food source for a lot of shorebirds, snowy clover being sort of the endangered species of that. Um, there's a lot of sort of sediment transfer um, when the kelp gets ripped out and the hold fast, which are anchoring the kelp onto the rocks, pull cobbles up and pull those onto the beach. And so there's this, this mix between uh, biological activity and kelp and habitat or sediment activity. And there's all kinds of lots of interesting bugs and sand crabs and things that you can find on the beach. So this is what the Santa Cruz sand shed, as I like to thought, think about beaches, is it stretches uh, roughly from Pillar Point up in Half Moon Bay, right at Mavericks, down to Monterey Submarine Canyon. And we get sediment from discharge of small creeks and from cliff erosion. And so this is, if we're going to manage our beaches in Santa Cruz, it's really hard to just manage one beach without managing the sediment inflows and outputs. So one of the ways we start to do it, and this is probably the closest thing to a data plot we have, is yeah, I have in this talk, is so here's Half Moon Bay. There's no sediment. You start at Pillar Point, and you start adding sand. Tunitas Creek, Onion Nuevo, all these creeks are in green, adding sand to the beach system. As we move down, all these greens or creeks adding sand, get to the San Lorenzo, and then you hit this orange bar, which is the Santa Cruz Harbor. And one of the ways we understand how much sand is moving along on an average annual sense is what sand we move from one side of the navigation channel to the other. And we have an average sense of that, but we also know that that varies significantly. Ultimately, all the sand is just falls off into the Monterey Submarine Canyon. So I want to touch a little bit on the Santa Cruz Harbor, and then I'm going to jump into coastal lagoons. Beaches are critical to coastal lagoons, and you can't talk about a lagoon without talking about the beach. But Santa Cruz Harbor is really interesting. One is that, um, so it was uh, authorized by voters in 1950. Um, many of you probably know all this history and could probably tell it to me way better than I'm going to summarize quickly. And it was constructed in Woods Lagoon. Um, Schwann Lake um, and Woods Lagoon made up Twin Lakes. We still talk about Twin Lakes. But the one that, uh, you know, the harbor is now where Woods Lagoon once was. Constructed 1962 to 64 with core and local match. And they acknowledged in the 50s that we were going to have a long-term sediment bypass 
issue. And that continues to this day. The dredging volumes average about 260,000 cubic yards per year. That's a lot of sand. Um, and, but they range based on storm conditions, based on how much sand has uh, been eroded from Seabright and how wide Seabright can, how much more sand Seabright can capture, ranges from 30,000 to 400,000 cubic yards per year. I'm not going to try anything fancy, but this is a cool little website at the harbor that talk, shows how the harbor was created. And you can look at the first picture when you go in, and it's sort of a montage of just still photos that were taken before the harbor and then during construction. I really encourage you to check it out. It's pretty, it's pretty enlightening. If you were to go to the next slide, please. Pardon? Oh. Um, this is Corcoran Lagoon. The opening picture from the Santa Cruz Harbor construction at Woods Lagoon looks almost identical to Corcoran Lagoon. This is the one with the radio towers in it. Okay? Very similar. They basic, we basically put in a dredge and just dredged our way out. To this day, during storm events, we have waves pushing sand and sediment. I saw during this storm event, which is in 2008, there was sand, there was huge drift logs in here, sand was pushed over, and there's, a, there's two new sandbars in Corcoran Lagoon that if you drive over, you'll notice. That came over in two events. Next slide. So we built this harbor. And this is what some historic air photos. This is 1928. Here's uh, San Lorenzo River. This is what's now the harbor of Woods Lagoon. This is Twin Lakes, uh, Schwann Lake, the wharf. 1928. Okay. This is 1943. You can see Seabright's still really narrow. There's a little bit more sand and sediment inside of Woods Lagoon because sand was washed over the beach and back into the lagoon. Next slide, please. 1956, okay, we find this is after the project had been authorized. Um, we're getting funding ready to start construction of the jetty. Still, you can see a very narrow Seabright beach. Big offset here between how wide the beach at Main Beach is boardwalk with San Lorenzo Point trapping sand up here and this beach really narrow. Next slide please. 1960, I guess 58 started construction of the growing. It was finished in 62 and then they started the dredging in between 62 and 64 to create the harbor. And immediately what happened is that we started to trap sand between this jetty and San Lorenzo Point. And you can see here, sort of um, on the side, you can see between 63 and 75 is that new sand compartment between San Lorenzo Point and the harbor was created. We started to really widen the Seabright Beach. Next slide, please. There's a plot showing how the shoreline evolved between 1963 in yellow and 1972 when we had to start pumping a lot of sand over the navigation. Next slide. So here's some fun pictures. Bandy and I went out today and took some of you know, the closest I could get to current conditions. This is what Seabright looked like before it started. Narrow, eroded, right back to the cliff. It looks like Pleasure Point almost. Here it is today. Uh, you can't see, even see it. The, the beach is somewhere over here. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, I, I recently learned that there used to be a castle in Santa Cruz. Okay. And uh, it is right across from where the Natural History Museum is today. Um, this is Seabright. There's an offshore rock here, San Lorenzo Point. This is looking now to the west, up towards Steamer Lane in the background of the wharf. This is San Lorenzo Point. This is what it looks like today. There's that same rock that is buried in sand, and sand goes around this point. Huge changes to this beach. Excellent. So I'm going to sort of shift gears a little bit and talk now about lagoons. Okay? And the central coast of California is really interesting because we have these what's called bar-built estuaries or coastal lagoons, 
where they go through this seasonal cycle. And the first st stage is when the beach is closed and the water from the watersheds and the creeks are coming in and slowly filling up behind the lagoons. And occasionally wave overtopping with big south swells or big events will wash salt water into the lagoons. And you get this really dynamic blend of salt water and fresh water in the lagoons that support a lot of the sensitive and dangerous species that we all know and love like salmon and steelhead that are rapidly dwindling and diminished. Um, what happens though is this fills up, we start to get flooding in places that are really close to zero. And as we get those houses start to get flooded, everybody wants to go, oh, well, let's just breach the lagoon. Well, these lagoons create this amazing nursery habitat for salmon and steelhead. Um, they, there's been some studies up at Scott Creek on the north coast where for every day that a baby tiny steelhead is in that lagoon, it grows over a millimeter a day. And so the longer they can stay in that lagoon in a closed system where they're getting a mix of salt and fresh water before they're ready to swim out into the ocean and go on their merry way into adulthood and adolescence, they are getting better equipped to survive in the ocean conditions. Traditionally, because there's people living at zero back behind these barrier beaches um, and these lagoons, we have breached them. And so we have decimated salmon and steelhead populations on the central coast because of this management practice. Naturally, what happens is this beach will fill up or the beach will build up, the water will fill close to the top, and then we'll get a little bit of a rain event and the beach will scour completely down and it becomes tidally influenced. And I have been on the San Lorenzo River and seen waves breaking up at Laurel Street Bridge during a high tide and a big wave event. Waves will move up the rivers. Um, really a lot of exchange, salt water exchange. And then as the beach wave energy dies, the river discharge, stream flow dwindles, we start to get more recovery of the beach. And it starts to just be sort of a spilling over the beach, fresh water discharge. And ultimately the beach recovers and closes the lagoon off. Okay? This is sort of a conceptual model how all these lagoons work. I'm going to show you some nat more natural examples and pictures. Please. So I'm going to show two breach events of Scott Creek, which again, north of Davenport. This is February of this year, two days after Banyan's birthday. <laughs> and the, uh, the beach, it, the sand is all the way to the highway. Um, the lagoon is really on the inland side. The next day, it starts raining really hard, scours all the way through and opens up. This is a 10 foot cut through the beach when that river opens. Huge, I mean, well over my hand. Next one. Here's what it looked like the day before. And the next one. The day after, you can see the mud left here. Um, and all of a sudden, you now have full exchange with the ocean. Caltrans is looking at replacing Scott Creek Bridge right now. Um, and there's an opportunity to restore a lot of the, um, the that lagoon habitat that was dismantled when they built it in the 30s. And that's a project I'm working on right now. But a really interesting opportunity to see how we can restore some of these nursery habitats on a creek that has been identified as critical for coho, salmon, and steelhead recovery. So there's some interesting work that will be coming up in the next, hopefully, five years. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, this is what it looks like on the inland side. This is when the lagoon, the beach is closed, the lagoon's filled up. This is up on the marsh plain. The actual creek channel is, in, is right over here. You can kind of see uh, some vegetation here. And then it breaches. Next slide, please. The whole floodplain, all the water is gone, um, and you're back to more of a, a, a wetland habitat up here instead of subtidal or wet. Next one. Um, it fills up again. This is 
uh, no, this is early, late November. We got a lot of waves overtopping, filling the lagoon. You can see this process happening. Next slide. Lagoon starts filling up. Next one. And then a couple days later, with a little bit of rain, it breaches. Now there's no such thing like there's no such thing as average annual erosion or average annual dredging. There's no such thing as an average breach. Sometimes the lagoon is fuller than others. Sometimes there's more stream flow. Sometimes there's more wave overtopping. The scour at this breach, next slide, please, was two feet, not ten feet of scour through the beach. So this breach, without more, um, you know, I've been out there now a, a bunch since December 3rd, and it's just trickling out. Whereas that first breach that scoured 10 feet, there was a river, a creek flowing for months. Who knows how long this one will stay open. That narrow window is when the steelhead and the salmon have to make their migration up the watersheds to spawn, and for steelhead, they'll go back out. The salmon will stay and you know, move on to the next phase. Um, next slide. So here's what that breach looked like again. Waddell Creek is a very another similar one. I'm just going to fly through these. Um, it, here, uh, go back one real quick. Here you can see the mouth really meandering to the south and breaching and coming out down here. Next one. Here it is filled to the brim. Not a lot of beach here. Up here is where a big basin comes out while the parking is. Next one. Here it is uh, a couple years ago, trickling out at the north end. Next one. Here it is after it's dewatered and there's a breach about mid beach. Next one. Here it is April of this year where it sort of punched all the way through and there was just a creek flowing. There was no lagoon real, a lot of, not much lagoon habitat. That breach scoured seven feet. And of course, Banyan had to go check how deep the water was, so I didn't let him wear his pants the rest of the day. <laughs> Next slide. But that was a seven foot scour across the beach. Here it was uh, you know, right around Thanksgiving of this year, starting to fill up again. Next one. And this, um, this was the day of the breach, and it's pretty fuzzy right here. Um, maybe go to the next one. But it reached to the north. This is the parking lot. And it was, the creek was actually scouring into the parking lot. As a scientist who's been studying coastal lagoons for almost 20 years, I have no idea why it goes to the south one year, to the middle of one year, and to the north another. It's a great mystery. The beaches and these coastal lagoons are magical, unknown science. We just don't understand them. There's an intuition. I mean, I can, I have a sense of when they're going to breach, and I can show up the day of the breach. And sometimes, if I'm really, you know, on it, I can be there as it's breaching, and I can kind of understand that. But I couldn't tell you if it's going to be the north, south, or middle. It's a really interesting phenomenon. Next one. Okay. So those were much more natural. And then we bring us to the wonderful San Lorenzo River, which used to have a 25,000 strong run of coho salmon annually. Um, this is where the rubber really hits the, meets the road. We have three federally listed endangered species, coho salmon, steelhead, and tidewater goby. And for those of you who don't know what tidewater goby looks like, imagine the movie Nemo. Nemo with like the little, you know, half fin on one side. They don't swim very well. Tidewater gobies don't swim at all. They actually hate tidewater. <laughs> they can live in really like super salty water or super fresh water, but if there's any flow, they're gone out to sea, and a big storm event can move all of them out of an entire system. Um, there's also federal and state historic landmarks, the boardwalk which are built at zero. The basement is below zero. Um, and I've been down there, it's really interesting. I didn't know that every piece of every ride at the boardwalk is made underneath there. 
It's really interesting. It's, it's definitely a mom and pop amusement park. They don't call up, you know, Six Flags R Us and call order roller coaster parts. They build them on site. It's pretty interesting. Um, there's also a lot of flooding issues, um, and there's a lot of public safety issues. When the lagoon gets full and you can't drive an emergency vehicle down here during Fourth of July weekend, they have to come from the volleyball courts. And somebody's drowning here, they're not going to get there anytime soon. So there's a lot of different issues right here. Yes, Fanny. Um, uh, I forgot. Okay, you can, I'll, I'll ask you later. Okay. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, this is what San Lorenzo Lagoon looked like in around 1892. There's a beautiful painting in the city manager's office. So this was all floodplain. This was Jesse Street Marsh, which is still a wetland. Um, and there's a conceptual restoration designed to reattach that to the San Lorenzo. And then this is that, uh, this is where Ocean View Park is now up here. And then there's that little channel that comes up in here. Um, the boardwalk wasn't in yet. Um, and you can see that this was a sand spit. Um, very different than today. So what happens now, what's been happening for 30 years is that once you get to five feet, and I'm gonna talk about NGVD is a elevation, National Geodetic uh, Vertical Datum of 1929 or National North American Vertical Datum of 19, 1988. Um, basically, that's how we measure what zero is relative to. Um, but what happens is, um, for 30 years, the boardwalk or the junior guards or uh, Banning and I with our shovels would go out and breach the lagoon artificially. And because of the endangered species issues, that practice has been stopped. Threatens with federal imprisonment if you do that now. And so the city, the boardwalk, everybody's now flooding. This was um, a picture uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, if you're coming down off Seabright toward Lower Ocean, you probably might have seen this sign. So it's yeah. right at Lower, where Ocean meets East Cliff there. This is not a leak, it is river water. There's water pouring out of the sidewalk, okay? This is November 25th this year. It hadn't rained in like two years. There's water percolating through the sidewalks because the lagoon was high because the beach was closed. This is only at seven feet. The beach at the highest point in the, in, on Main Beach is like nine feet. So if it gets up to nine feet, this is gonna be geysers coming out of the sidewalk. This was my neighbor, this is Rachel's basement. <laughs> They're in the lower ocean neighborhoods. This is something that's happening today. So the city's really having to try and figure out what do we do, how do we appease the regulatory agencies over habitat concerns, and how do we balance that with all these other things. 2012, we had a big flood event, or a big river flow event, and the river decided it liked to go west. And it almost took out the boardwalk. And there was a mad dash, they were bulldozing day and night trying to redirect the river. This was running all the way down, um, almost to where, uh, right now there's a bunch of sheet pile steel beams that go down, um, and then there's a part, you can't see it, and maybe uh, right here, this little greenhouse kind of sticks out. Right here, this I think is the um, gondola ride uh, loading station. And uh, right over there, from that point to the west, it changes the, the foundation of the boardwalk. If it gets down there, then all of the gears and the infrastructure for the Giant Dipper and a lot of the carousel and rides are gone. So this was a really like hold the line or else. Well, so that happened, that that was alleviated. They, they were managed to redirect the river. Um, and so I have some pictures, just this is what the river, you know, calm like sort of today after it's breached. There's sand in here and a little bit of habitat. Next one. This is what it looks like under a big river flow. This is December 2013. Um, river came up about six feet in like four hours or something. Big rainstorm. Big logs floating through. Next one. This is what the lagoon looked like today or this, this fall. 
not any flow, and the, the water levels in the lagoon were higher than during that major flow event, just because the beach was closed. Next one. And we had some lovely algae. Um, here's what the beach looked like in, in July, or excuse me, in August. Next slide. Here's what it was. This is right after Hurricane Maria, a very abnormal, maybe a 10-year south swell event, put a ton of sand, moved the whole beach back about 25 yards into the lagoon, um, and brought a lot of algae and trash. And then it breached eventually. And you can just kind of scroll through these. This is like almost a day-to-day. -day. We were, but you'll notice in here up against the boardwalk, that same flow path that the river had taken that they had sort of redirected the river is still really low and it is the, the, the boardwalk is still really vulnerable right now. Next one. So this is what it looked like after a breach. You can see a high tide it flowed out here. High tide washed sand in, started to redirect and meander the river this way. Next one. And we started to get some waves that push, it started to erode this low lying area. There's that greenhouse, and you can see the sand just drops right here. Next one. Again, it's starting to redirect back. Next one. A low tide picture. Next one. Keep going. Then we started getting some more rainfall, thankfully. And this is stop here for a second. This is with a high tide and some waves. Waves are again, now it's waves lapping up at the boardwalk and not just the, you know, here, not just the river. Next one. So after the waves die, next one. This is a, a, a really low tide, but you can see the shape of the river now is pointed where the river left off in 2012. It's the deepest part of the river. I was really nervous for the boardwalk at this point. Um, the river looked like if it had gone, it was going to take out a bunch of the rides. Next one. No waves, really, just a high tide. Next one. Then we had the big, the 20-year storm event or whatever, everybody, you know, with, where we had a lot of rain. Um, and we were, the waves were much smaller than predicted, actually. For in Santa Cruz. So we still had waves hitting the seawall at the boardwalk, but they weren't the same size that I thought they might be. Next one. Day after it started to diminish, but you can see how the beach sort of had all pulled back a little bit. Next one. And then basically the river punched through straight up. But you can see that this is where the river channel had been. And this is still incredibly low back in here. So that's today. <laughs> Things are not going to get better in the future. The IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is 2,500 of the world's best leading climate scientists. And if you know any two scientists, it's hard for them to agree on anything. What comes out in the IPCC reports is a consensus of 2,500 scientists that has been wordsmithed by the governments of the world. So what's in here is pretty much fact in the science world. And it has a lot of uh, implications. Next one. I really like this slide. This is from an older IPCC report. but. This is a really interesting piece. So the way you look at climate change is greenhouse gas emissions. And greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. But if we were to stop emitting carbon dioxide in 2007, when this was plotted, we would see a CO2 emissions peak in the atmosphere between, you know, in the next 100 years by 2107. And then that would drop off. Then carbon dioxide in the entire atmosphere would stabilize 100 to 300 years after that. Temperature, which lags carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 
lags a few centuries. Sea level rise, which is composed of two components. One is thermal expansion, warmer water takes up more volume. And ice melt would be with us for the next several thousand years. So sea level rise is going to be rising for the next several thousand years if we'd stopped carbon dioxide emissions in 2007. But we, had, we didn't do that. So when people start talking about, well, we're going to see five feet of sea level rise maybe by 2100, and people go, oh, no, that's, I can't possibly do that. Let's not focus on when it's going to happen. We are going to be looking, the, what humans have done is started a, a train wreck down the tracks. It's going to be with us for several thousand years, and that's if we really hit the brakes soon. If all the ice melts, we're looking at 220 feet of sea level rise around the globe with no ice on the planet. So as long as your house is over 220 feet, you should be fine. This is not, next slide please. So I've been doing a bunch of mapping of projecting future sea level rise hazards. Um, this is the boardwalk here, the wharf, San Lorenzo River. Um, my neighborhood's in here. Um, as a hydrologist, I'm renting. <laughs> hydrologist saying, are you stupid, Dave? Why are you living there? Well, that's great. It's close to everything. I can get to the beach. I can get to the wharf. I can go downtown. It's really convenient. But this is where the water's percolating out of the sidewalks today just because the beach was closed. If we add five feet, you know, and take some very simple geometries, we're gonna see those beaches also rise five feet. We couldn't see nine feet of water in, that, in the San Lorenzo. All of this in green here and blue would be wet and underwater if we see five feet of sea level. That is a pretty grim picture for Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz, from other places that I've done this mapping, actually fares pretty well, because we've got a lot of cliffs. Sea level, or it also accelerates coastal erosion, so that's another compounding factor. But next slide. So we sort of get to this question, and this isn't gonna be a, um, this was an animation, it won't be that way. But basically every community has to decide, so this is risk, and this is time or sea level rise. And to adapt, we have some choices to make. As we go through time, so this red line, basically more people and property are gonna become threatened as we go in time, risk is gonna increase in time or sea level rise. And we have a choice. We can decide to hold the lines and get New Orleans on it. We can decide to gracefully get out of the way, as is being done in say Monterey, the whole window to the window by, to the bay, um, down at Lower Del Monte. They have been, the city has been buying for the last 35 years, a lot of those low-lying industrial sites, removing the buildings and turning it into parkland. Not because they're worried about sea level rise, but because they don't want to lose that connection to the ocean and to the Monterey Bay. That is something that we're gonna to have to start embracing as communities much more frequently if we want to have that same type of uh, relation with our coast, instead of just being fearful of it. Or we can change use. We can turn all of beach flats and all of lower ocean neighborhood into a trailer park. And when the waters come up, we can drive the RVs away. <laughs> These are adaptation choices, and there's a lot of different things we can do, but we have to start thinking when we are going to make those decisions. And this yellow box represents the community's willingness to accept the risk. Are we willing to accept a couple puddles in a sidewalk, you know, for a couple months of the year? Or are we gonna be looking at feet of water in neighborhoods for the summer or year round. At some point, we're gonna make a decision that's gonna lower our risk. We're gonna start elevating all the houses. 
or pulling out of certain neighborhoods or certain locations. Or saying, we don't care about coho salmon, we don't care about steelhead, we're going to just keep opening the river. These are some of the kinds of decisions and trade-offs we're going to have to make as a community. And that involves a lot of discussion. Um, next one. Well, I guess that's what I have for today. <laughs> um, yes, questions? Since the harbor opened in 62-ish, mean low or low water, how, how much has that risen? Mean low or low water, um, I would have to look at the specific numbers. Basically, mean low or low water is evaluated every 18.6 years, which is basically the, the tidal epic. Um, and so it has moved up. Um, I want to say in the magnitude of an inch, inch and a half, um, between as we adjust the epic. When we have a big El Nino event, the 82, 83, and 97, 98, both fell into this most recent tidal epic that recalculated mean low or low water. And that really jumped it up. Because during an El Nino, we tend to get six inches of uh, water levels above predicted tide levels. So for those for a couple of years in that 18 year period, is enough to bump it up at almost an inch. Yes? I think that he was first. I, he was, but he already had a question. <laughs> or an ovation. Danny, do you have a question? Um, how far does the tide water gobies go out? How far do the tide water gobies go out into the ocean or in the lagoon? Into the ocean and then come back. So tide water gobies are, they're like Nemo. They don't swim very well. And so when they get pushed out during a big stream flow, or one of the fears with the artificial breaching is that we rapidly lower the lagoon waters and push all these little Nemo fish, tidewater gobies out. They don't have the capability of really swimming back into that lagoon. So once they get pushed out, they pretty much will swim in the ocean for a little bit until they get eaten by birds or other fish, or until they get washed down the coast and find another open lagoon like um, Twin Lakes or uh, Moran Lake, where we used to Ergo, um, or some of the other lagoons, Corcoran Lagoon. And so s periodically during a big flow event, sometimes a system will lose all the gobies and the gobies will appear in the system down the coast a little bit. But that really is hard to judge. They don't swim very well. I wondered what has affected any, an event like the tidal wave very damaging to the harbor, but is that exacerbated by the ocean rise at all? Um, it would. Um, you know, sea level rise is kind of like a slow moving disaster. Erosion, big El Nino events, big tsunami events are going to have a larger impact for a longer, you know, in a short term. Um, basically what that happens, I mean, if you look at that March 18th event a couple of years ago, if that had hit during a high tide, we would have, the harbor would have been pretty much entirely wrecked. But it hit during a low tide. So the difference would be if we had sea level rise of six inches or a foot, then it would be closer more and more at a high tide level or even higher. And so damages would be much more extensive. Do you have 2,500 scientists to say that there is no global warming? <laughs> um, I don't know, too. <laughs> um, you're saying that the, the sea level is rising, you know, whatever it is. Is the land rising or dropping due to geological things like earthquakes and stuff? Absolutely. And That's how, how much is, is it at a comparable? Or? Of That's a great question. Um, and I didn't get into too much sea level rise science. Um, but sea level rise is typically measured at tide stations and is sort of predicted globally. And so 
the predictions now for global sea level rise are about 3.1, 3.2 millimeters per year. There are, but that's all of the water rising. Now, in places like New Orleans, where oil and gas and groundwater extraction, the land is subsiding and sinking. And so you have plus three, minus 14, you have a net of 17 millimeters a year. In uh, California, we have sort of two provinces. Based at Cape Mendocino, we have um, where the San Andreas goes off offshore, um, we have much less natural uplift in the coast. So sea level's rising faster along the central and southern California coast than north of Cape Mendocino, where the land is still rising a little faster. So when you look at the relative, the land, the land motion from tectonics and the global sea level rise, you take that difference and you get what's called relative sea level rise. In places like Alaska, because it's been weighted down by ice for so long, as that ice melts, there's this, this process called isostatic rebound. It's basically if you push your ice cube down in your cocktail and you kick your finger off and the ice cube comes back up. That's what the land's doing in Alaska. So up there, it's coming up faster than sea level. They're not worried about sea level rise. They're worried about permafrost melting you know, the land. <laughs> yeah? Um, there was Um, I heard about that. I have not been tracking that one in particular, but that's uh, part of the coastal processes. I mean, waves are smashing into the cliffs. I know when they built the Pleasure Point seawall at first, they tried to, the condition from the Coastal Commission was you had to sort of contour to the sea caves, and a lot of what happens in cliffs is the waves will eat away at the toe, it sort of over steepens, creates a notch, and then it sort of calves off and rock top topples and then kind of becomes vertical and then it sort of does that and sort of marches its way back. And in certain parts of the geology, whatever it is, there's different weaknesses or stripes or dips or jointing in the rocks and so water will tunnel preferentially in some places and it just came up there. What might be the policy like for scientists in Santa Cruz who like evaluate that? Would they just say abandoned property? Would they say fill in the cave? Or um, it, it really comes down to an engineering approach and what's permittable under the Coastal Act. Um, you know, when uh, for Pleasure Point Seawall, for example, they, they built, they contoured it, and they realized that a lot of the oceanfront homes were having plates falling off the walls and pictures falling off the walls during high wave events because they basically sealed those caves so it uh, reverberated even more than it had naturally. And so the Coastal Commission allowed them to go back and sort of fill out more of the cave so you had less of that reverberation. So it's going to depend on how the Coastal Commission rules. Um, where does the city council stand here in terms of the risk of rising sea levels? And do they have a vision for that, which coincides with, with your opinion? And findings? Um, I cannot speak on behalf of the city council. <laughs> <laughs> Are you interacting with that? Um, I have provided a lot of the mapping. I've done that for all of Santa Cruz County and most of Monterey County. Um, and they have been aware of that information. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a balance. You know, you see this slow moving disaster coming and you know, you have water leaking out of your sidewalks and you know, potholes and you know, drug problems and lack, you know, you know, gang violence. And so it's it's a juggling act. I think that, um, I know the city has been very supportive of trying to find uh, a resolution to the San Lorenzo issue and has been spending you know, quite a bit of money to try and solve that and balance all of those needs. Um, I think with climate change, it's going to take, you know, it's, it's not, fortunately because it's coming and we can see it coming, it needs to be incorporated at basic decisions. 
capital improvement plans? You know, are we going, when we're repaving streets, instead of putting down four inches, two inches of asphalt, let's put down four. You know, it can be, we can adapt slowly to sea level rise. There's going to be some hard decisions when we get to tipping points where it's like, okay, well, we can no longer habitat you know, live in these areas because there's, it's, it's not once or twice a year or five times a year, it's every day. And so I think that there are, there are policies, the city of Santa Cruz actually has uh, the first climate adaptation plan that's been approved. So the city of Santa Cruz is really progressive in terms of thinking about climate change and thinking about um, having a plan on how to start to adapt how that gets implemented, that's the question. You know, they, they're supposed, they have a plan on CO2 reduction, yes. where they're supposed to insulate a lot of government buildings, these kind of things, so that's one big mm -hmm. uh, component of it, to reduce it. And the other one are cars, of course. Yeah? But to my knowledge, they are not really active. There are definitely steps to improve transportation. I know there's a big regional transportation commission uh, effort to sort of not going anywhere. The rails to trails program is really starting to come along. I mean, you know, the solution in Santa Cruz traffic is to get people out of cars. And that would work if everybody was willing to bike. I mean, the new Arana Gulch Bridge is going to open, I think, in the next week or so. Are you open? Right. So, um, you know, there's, there's, Little steps, but you know, I don't. I think if it was just up to the city of Santa Cruz and the residents of Santa Cruz, I think we would get much farther along. But the fact that we swell to triple our population, you know, every summer weekend, there's a lot of other compounding factors, and that's one of the challenges with climate change. Is it's not something that can be solved locally. It really takes a regional approach, and so. I know I'm working on about half a dozen projects in the Monterey Bay region, working with a lot of jurisdictions, a lot of stakeholders to try and bring, you know, sound science and economics and what can we do and how, what are the trade-offs. So there, there's a lot at work. Um, the state is finally starting to fund that work. I think there's going to be a lot more movement now that the water bond passed. There'll be a lot of work and investment that goes into water. You know, diversifying a water portfolio, water supply, and so I think there's some good things on the horizon, but it is something that's going to be a slow moving battle. Yeah. A number of scientists have sponsored the drilling of core samples all over this planet, including in the within oceans, and those core samples show that we have had global warming every 1,200 to 1,500 years, plus or minus 500, for the last tens of thousands of years. So in all past global warming, the global warming would last 150 to 200 years. In the earlier global warming events, after the peak, it would return to normal. And there was not uh, greenhouse gas in those earlier centuries. Are you now saying that in this global warming period, much of it apparently is caused by natural causes, since that's what occurred earlier, that the addition of the greenhouse gases has caused a tipping point and we will not return to a more, more normal stance as we have in all the earlier events for tens of thousands of years? Is that what we're now hearing? There's a lot, there's a, a long and a short answer to that. And um, there are natural ice age cycles that are related to the orbit of the Earth around the sun, the orbit of the moon around the Earth, and the wobble of, of the Earth around its axis. And they all have different cycles, 40,000, 120 and 420,000 years. When they align, you get ice ages, and the sea level will drop. Um, sea level, the last ice age was about 18,000 years ago, and the, the shoreline was out at the continental shelf, five miles offshore. What we've seen, though, now through a lot of the climate modeling is that, and we've been able to look at that 
through time and go back in time and model those based on these um, different or orbital cycles and patterns. But what is different now, and just to put in context, the, the last time we saw rapid ice melt that we're seeing, you know, the closest thing we've seen in the geologic record to this, we were looking at four meters, about 13 feet of sea level rise in 100 years. So that's natural rates. The fastest one we've ever documented through ice cores and you know all of the ocean drilling program research. But what's different now is that the climate models can no longer account for what we're observing on the planet unless you factor in the changes in greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere since we started burning fossil fuels in the 1800s. So that's the change, is that from the modeling piece, and I'm, I, I do climate modeling, all models are wrong. Some of them are useful, okay? So take it all with a grain of salt, but I will say that there is, with, we've had to add a whole new parameter of people into the climate models to be able to basically repeat what we're observing today. So that's the shorter answer. We can talk a lot more about the details if, if you want to later. Yeah? You seem to settle on five feet of uh, sea level rise here. That's a sign that what's your confidence level? 95%? Is that 100% that we're going to get five feet in the next 50 years? What is your confidence level? Um, there was a, I would say that my confidence is that we will see at least three feet by 2100. Um, three feet in the next nine years. Next nine years, years we'll so see at least five three foot, feet. What, what was the five foot? Five point? feet is the closer to the higher end of some of the estimates. There's a really good report that came out in 2012, published by the National Research Council, that basically looked at the Oregon, Washington, California coast, and looked at all of the published literature, um, scientific literature on sea level rise and it sort of evaluated relative land motions across the, the west coast and sort of came up with some ranges. And the range for San Francisco, including vertical land motion, was about, okay, it's 90, about 94 centimeters plus or minus 25 centimeters. And I have 10 fingers and toes, so when I try and go into 12, doesn't work as well. Um, so, uh, I'm not even trying to do math right now. That's just going to be embarrassing. <laughs> but that, that's the estimate. It's about 93 centimeters average, plus or minus 25 centimeters. Now, what it looks like, and that's by 2100, I should say. As you far, get farther out in time, the uncertainty gets larger. Most of the climate models and the projections are pretty uniform until about 2050, and then they just scatter. So there's a lot more certainty about the le rates of rise and the levels of sea level rise to about 2050, and then it starts, to, the uncertainties get much larger. Last question, what is your recommendation for the San Lorenzo River management? I wish they would have gotten back to me today in case somebody asked that question. <laughs> um, we're looking at a couple of different options right now. Um, there in September, uh, the city and the seaside company, the boardwalk, um, we did a controlled, uh, we, we had a temporary channel opening where we lowered the lagoon waters about two feet to reduce all the flooding through the sidewalks and stuff. Um, that only lasted about three, four weeks, and then it was right back up. Um, so we're looking at some longer term alternatives that would probably involve some culverts that once it got to a certain level would start to you know, spill water over the beach without opening it quickly. That's something that the city is starting to move through permitting and environmental review now. So there's some solutions, some short term solutions that we'll investigate and then 
depending upon how that works, we may look at that either making that a longer term solution or looking at some other options. The, the culvert that you just mentioned, is that what still Cal Creek has in Capitola? That's a little bit different. The, the flume they have in SoCal Creek, um, I really don't think would work in San Lorenzo. Uh, SoCal Creek doesn't have the same volume and you know storm flows uh, or debris in terms of either algae or uh, or you know root wads and drift logs and stuff like that. Um, so we're looking at something a little bit different that may be something put in in the summer to help keep it and then removed you know, right after the first breach before we get all the big winter storms. So not necessarily permanent. Right. We may be looking at some permanent alignments, but we're gonna kind of try and fine tune an interim solution and then say, okay, this seems to be working or this isn't working, we need to look at something first. They're, the city's trying to take steps and been involved in a lot of, you know, hand holding with regulatory agencies and really trying to walk through that process. Um, to sort of meet all of those different objectives. Endangered species, flooding, historic preservation, and public safety. So, yeah. yeah well, I remember, I, I moved to San Diego in like 66, and there were still steelhead in the San Lorenzo River, but they were dying out. And, and what, in your opinion, what, what was the major cause of the loss of the steelhead? Was it pollution, or was it uh, the way we managed the river, or what? I think it's all of the above. Um, you know, in the 60s, that's before Loma Prieta, there was a lot more uh, lagoon habitat. There was more marsh plain down there. We didn't have the river levees confining the river as much. Um, but, you know, 40 years of artificial breaching. I mean, there's a, I'm not a biologist first, I'll put that disclaimer out again. <laughs> um, I know that people have been looking at that. Um, I would say that it's a host of problems, you know, a suite of problems, and I don't know that there's any one that is, you know, we can say it's that, that's it. It's sort of like the water pollution, the ocean water quality in cows, it's probably five or six different things, it's not one. Yeah, in the back. Well, I always had the impression that we didn't realize how much sand was going to come into this harbor when we built it, and how, what a problem the building was going to be. Then when I listen to your talk and you're saying they always kind of knew that this build up was going to be this big. Did they know it was going to be that big or did they really underestimate it? And I really think that we overfished to steal it. I, I think that's, do. that I would say that's definitely one of the issues too. Um, for steel. Um, without a doubt they knew in advance that there was going to be um, sand sediment shoaling at the harbor entrance. Um, they learned that lesson in Santa Barbara Harbor in the 20s. Um, I think what what happened when they first did it, when they first built the jetty, um, is um, actually, is it still live? Oh, we can make it, I think. Um, that, that area, remember that, that plot that I showed that had the different shorelines and how long it took to fill up Seabright Beach? Mm -hmm. During that time, the, uh, the harbor dredging was pretty small. It was like 70,000 cubic yards a year because it was all filling up. There was some bypassing. And so they said, oh, okay, 70,000 is not so bad. We can deal with that. And it's been growing. And I have, I brought the dredge records, if technology can be on our <laughs> side again. Um, and you can see very four sort of distinct periods where the volume of sand coming that had to be managed. And it's been growing um, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, so it would be the last, keep going past the question. So uh, oh, oh, yeah. OK, that one. All right, you probably can't read it all. But basically, between. Uh, 64 and 76, we were looking at about 79,000 cubic yards a year. Once Seabright filled up, then it doubled. And we were at like 150,000. A little smaller. Oh, you yeah. to maybe turn your phone. There you go. <laughs> That's first time me too. So it was about 150,000 cubic yards. 
and then um, and then toward uh, you know then it started to increase again um, a little bit more because we deepened the draft and the nav navigation channel so we had to dredge more but then between 97 and 2007 um, and presumably to today I only had found this when they went to 2007 we had a lot more energetic storms we sort of shifted uh, cycles shifted climate cycles there's everybody I'm not gonna assume most people have heard of El Nino's and La Nina's one's more energetic than others here in Santa Cruz um, there's a larger climate cycle that functions on about a 30-year time period called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and this energetic time between 97 2007 um, and really through sort of like the late you know through the early 80s these two time periods together um, were really energetic but we had a lot more large storm events in the last decade and so the dredge records went up to about uh, 260,000 we'll go up a little bit yeah two, 270,000 cubic yards in the last decade so it's kind of related to the storm frequency and intensity as well as the depth we're trying to keep open yeah, I want to come back uh, to your picture here with the modeling of the flooding of Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. What was the sea level rise for that assumption? Uh, that was... Uh, yeah, this one. That was... I said five feet. Yeah, I want to say five feet. Yeah, okay, so if points. you say three feet, you're pretty comfortable. That's pretty... Well, so... <laughs> This light blue here, this blue yeah. right here, is existing. <laughs> That's like today. <laughs> this green, so the green is not hydraulically connected through the surface. So there's no surface connection to a lot of these areas, like this whole yeah. lower ocean neighborhood. But you know, I have pictures from this last event and through the summer from in my backyard. Whereas I'm working on the river project, <laughs> had four inches of standing water and it hadn't rained in months. Wow. So there's a sub, you know, a subterranean <coughs> connection, groundwater issue here too that's not modeled in this at all. This is just, um, this is just coastal process of use. Uh, yeah. Back. I feel a lot like, can you speak of the integrity of the levee and like what? I'm not going to touch that one, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Army Corps of Engineers assures us we're safe. But this is the same type of flooding that happened earlier in the 1900s, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, this happens all the time. Yeah. I mean, every coastal lagoon, I mean, Carmel River, I mean, I could have put this same talk together for Santa Barbara and shown Santa Barbara Airport same issue in Goleta Slough. They've been breaching the, the slough now for 30 years. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said stop, you can't do it. It filled up to nine feet and the runways were this close to being underwater. And the <laughs> FAA is like, wait a minute here. Okay, you can have an emer emergency permit. We had no idea it was gonna do that. I mean, that's what's happening is that, you know, it's like, okay, fine, we'll wait. Oh, wow, you can't get there. Huh? Emergency act services can't get there because there's flooding. Huh, I guess we need an emergency permit. But, you know, at some point, the regulatory agencies are like, okay, well, it can't be an emergency if we see it coming five years out. <laughs> so that's kind of this change in management and as we, our understanding of the science of these lagoons is grown. I just have a question regarding Aptos Creek and uh, the Rio de Mar Beach there. Mm -hmm. Over the past, I, I know within the last five years that there have been at least two times when the the, um, the creek was um, was actually breached with a uh, caterpillar. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, one time that creek was a, a swimming pool. Um, and, uh, and and any given it must be encroachment of houses or something that has caused them to breach that because of uh, safety issues. But at one time, I mean, I've never seen it water get as high enough for anyone to dive off one of those concrete walls into it. So I'm just curious, uh, we say that there's a huge regulation on that. What is it that requires that? Uh, the regulation of? Of reaching. 
that's largely related to endangered species at this point. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, so with that given, what is it that triggers someone, uh, you know, the authorities going to, to go in and actually breach that by themselves? It's the typically breach. what people were doing before, yeah. which was to alleviate flooding. Because we had a management regime that said, okay, well, we're going to just breach this thing, keep it open. Yeah. And so, well, this is dry, let's build here. I mean, Aptos is yeah. unique. I mean, all of Aptos, they basically, you know, that lower Rio del Mar, they filled, they cut into the cliff and pushed out on the beach and armored it. And, um, there's a lot of issues going on at Aptos, too. Um, but across the state, really what's happening is there's this dawning realization of how important these lagoons are to these endangered species. And so they're trying to better manage the lagoons, but we're changing the management regime from something that was keep it open so that five feet and above was always dry, and now it's flooding to 10 feet. And so, you know, on the Carmel River, you know, they're looking at, let's build a, basically a levee to keep, you know, the attorney for Apple's house dry so we don't get sued for allowing flooding to happen to save endangered species. I mean, these are the kinds of trade-offs that are happening up and down the California coast as we, as the understanding of the importance of lagoons has come on, the, the functioning of the lagoons, most of the lagoon work to date has been done by biologists, which are great at the species and habitat species, but don't necessarily consider the physical processes, what builds the beaches, what moves the beaches, how much sand, how frequent, how high, all of those kinds of things are just starting to get woven into that discussion. So, I know I didn't give you a... Uh, they're removing the dam on Car Carmel Creek too, further up. The yes, river. well, they're rerouting the river yeah. and gluing the sediment that should be there, which would be nourishing the beaches down there, in place, mm -hmm. because they don't want to have some seismic issue. That's an interesting one. There's a couple of dams coming out in coastal California. It will be interesting to see how they all go. Yeah. How would you compare the, the problems we have on the West Coast to the problems that, when I go on the East Coast, I see all these barrier islands and all this building on the barrier islands. It would seem like they have a, an order of magnitude larger problem than we do. Clearly. Yeah. Uh, I do a lot of hazard mapping, and um, I have sort of a high, I have four hazard zones. Low, medium, high, and stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really when we start talking about sea level rise and what we're going to have to, to the realities we're gonna have to face globally, I mean, we have to think about how do we retreat Manhattan, Miami, Bangladesh, <coughs> LA. I mean, we are talking about moving some of the largest population centers on Earth to accommodate what we can see for sea level rise. I mean, it's, it's a massive problem, and a lot of people are looking at the Dutch as they've figured it out. And they have this intricate series of levees, and they have certain times a year that you can go out on s certain parts of the levees and they have, they're mining sand from the North Sea and nourishing beaches. They have, it's a totally engineered coastline. And people are looking at it like that's the solution. And that's where I've been getting more interested in the economic trade-offs because we can get Dutch on it and, or New Orleans on it and just keep building higher walls and buy bigger pumps and pump more sand and do all of these things, or we can look at how do we get that out of the way gracefully. And there's parts of the cultural, uh, there will be parts of the cultures that are lost when we do that. But those are the trade-offs and, you know, a lot of the economics analysis that are done to date are based on protection of private property and storm damage reduction. They don't look at what would Santa Cruz be like without any beaches or surf spots, or what would, um, how would we, uh, you know, what would 
the Monterey Bay Sanctuary coastline be without any beaches? And so when you, you know, some of the economic analysis and economists I've been working with have really been focused on bringing in, uh, trying to quantify nature's defenses, the value of a beach, the value of a wetland, the value of a sand dune, um, the recreational value. And when you start adding those as additional terms in your traditional cost benefit analysis, you come out with a very different answer. And some of the things that we've been doing for years, like setbacks for coastal prop for a oceanfront property, shows to be the dumbest thing we can do. But again, it's an evolution of the thought and starting to go, hey, there's a value just for that beach to be there. Because we're getting people coming here so they can go to the beach. And <coughs> practice building sand castles and pull back the ocean. <laughs> One more question. One more question. Oh. Daniel, last there, chance, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. One in the back. Yeah. Is there, um, is there any impact that you can see from these plans to keep up the work, or are there other projects that you're concerned about that either have positive or negative effects? I don't, I think the wharf, again, I don't think there's anything with the wharf that I'm really concerned about. I, I'm actually looking forward to maybe having a tide gauge in Santa Cruz um, and having some places to get some more local science and information to, make, to better understand what happens here. Um, I, you know, honestly, I'm really concerned about the big infrastructure pieces the wastewater infrastructure and the transportation bridge infrastructure, because those are the bottlenecks for adapting. I mean, if we have to buy a few houses and tear them down and let some coastal erosion happen, if that's what the community wants to do, we can afford that. But when we get pigeonholed into, you know, 50-year-old wastewater infrastructure that flows to zero and then, the, you know, which is, it all does, and zero becomes five feet higher and we're depending on gravity to feed it up, we're going to be in a world of hurt. There's a lot of human health issues that are associated with that. Um, I look at every bridge crossing or every creek crossing along the coast, and there are millions, millions of dollars of projects there for each one of them. And we don't have a good example yet. I hope Scott Creek will be one of those first examples. It's like, hey, let's do this differently and accommodate the function and the physical process instead of do the traditional engineering calculation of, you know, trapezoid channel and, you know, flood conveyance. Let's think about the larger perspective and how things might evolve because those big infrastructure pieces are the ones that have the longest lead time and will be the biggest bottlenecks. If we have our, I mean, the bridges are 50, 75 to 100 years, wastewater infrastructure, 50 to 75 years. We're going to see dramatic changes in the next 100 years that if we don't make some decisions in the next 25 years, we're going to be stuck. And then we're going to be kind of forced into a New Orleans situation where we're going to be teetering like Sacramento is, <laughs> um, where, you know, one earthquake away from devastation. And so I'm really hoping that we can make some really intelligent decisions on capital improvements so that you know when we when we're ripping up you know capital avenue for the next fiber optic cable we start laying sewage pipelines and stuff back there so that we're not running it along east cliff or in monterey they're running all their sewage infrastructure is under the beach <laughs> you know <laughs> clean water funds in the epa in the 70s paid for a lot of that infrastructure, and it was great to deal with point source pollution, but it wasn't, you know, they were like, what's the cheapest way to get this done? What's the flattest place we can find? Oh, that looks pretty flat. It's easy to dig in the sand. Done. For now. But that's that's my biggest concern. Thank you, guys. Those were good fun. See you next Wednesday if we don't see you Saturday night.